Welcome, and thank you for joining us for today's webcast, Aviation Thermal Management, Survivability of Mission Critical Electronic Components for Commercial and Military Aircraft, sponsored by Advanced Cooling Technologies and Tech Briefs Media Group. I'm Bruce Bennett, editor with Tech Briefs Media Group, and I'll be your moderator today. Our webcast will last approximately 30 minutes, and there will be a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. If you have a question, you may submit it at any time during the presentation by entering it in the box at the bottom of your screen. Our presenter will answer as many questions as possible at the conclusion of the presentation, and those questions not addressed during the live event will be answered after the webcast. In order to view the presentation properly, please disable any pop-up blockers you may have on your browser. At this time, I'd like to introduce our speakers. John Hartenstein, Manager of Aerospace Products, has been with Advanced Cooling Technologies since 2005. He has over 26 years of experience in research and product development engineering, focusing on advanced thermal management, including heat pipes. He is a co-inventor on three U.S. patents and has co-authored over 30 papers. He holds the Master of Science in Systems Engineering, Pennsylvania State University, Great Valley. Dr. Bill Anderson is the Chief Engineer at Advanced Cooling Technologies. He has a BS, MS, and PhD degrees in Mechanical Engineering from MIT, with over 30 years of experience in two-phase heat transfer. He has designed and developed a number of unique heat transfer devices, ranging in temperature from hydrogen LHPs at 20K to lithium mag magnetoplasma dynamic devices operating at temperatures over 2,000 degrees centigrade and with heat fluxes up to 6,400 watts per square centimeter. For the last few years, Dr. Anderson has been developing high temperature heat pipes and radiators for nuclear fission and electric propulsion and working on thermal management systems for full authority digital engine control and other avionics boxes. So at this time, I'd like to hand the program over to John Hartenstein. John? Thank you, Bruce. Uh, good afternoon. The, uh, the motivation for this webinar is to address some of the unique cooling challenges facing avionics design engineer of flight crit critical avionics, where key components must be maintained below specific temperatures. Some of these challenges include wide uh, temperature extremes, thermal cycling, reduced system volume, uh, as we all know, we're, we're trying to pack a greater number of higher power electronics into smaller volumes, uh, accelerations, and also the lack of effective heat sinks. So the products that are directly applicable for thermal management of these systems are heat pipes and high-K plates. So our agenda for the, for the webinar this afternoon is we're going to talk about heat pipes, uh, briefly go over their operation uh, capabilities, and then get into some more detail on design and uh, manufacturing guidelines, and then spend some time on reliab several reliability topics, temperature extremes, thermal cycling, acceleration, shock and vibration. And then we will talk about some related technologies, uh, go over an avionics case study, and then wrap up. So with that, let's get started. There are a number of thermal products that can be used for the cooling of avionics depending upon the application. As stated in the, in the motivation, two of these products are heat pipes and high K plates. In addition, Vapor chambers, pump single phase and two phase systems can also be used uh, for a variety of applications such as power electronics, RF amplifiers, portable electronics. The uh, photos that you see here on this slide, the lower left is an example of, a, of an assembly with embedded heat pipes in it for spot cooling. The photo in the, in the lower center is a case where one side of the, um, there's two fin stacks shown there, one side was, had a lot more power uh, it was dissipating a lot more power than the other side, and we embedded heat pipes within the, within the base plate of that heat sink to spread the thermal lo load out and increase the thermal performance. And on the lower right is for a concentrated photovoltaic application where we were cooling, um, used a heat pipe, cooled it with the evaporator in the center and two condensers on either end. So we're briefly going to go over heat pipe basics. We'll focus on that. Uh, Heat pipes are passive two-phase heat exchangers, uh, and they are, op they are a closed system. Heat pipes are vacuum tubes with a prescribed amount of working fluid inside. So you put heat in one end, it causes the fluid to evaporate, the vapor goes to the coldest end of the pipe, uh, condenses on the wall, gives up its late heat of vaporization, then the fluid is drawn back to the, uh, 
um, evaporator through a pore structure that is bonded on the inside wall of the tube. So an analogy of this pumping the fluid back to the evaporator would be if you were to take a napkin and dip it in your coffee in the morning, how it soaks it up, it's, it's pretty much the same thing. So a heat pipe is relying on uh, two-phase heat transfer, which has very high heat transfer coefficients. As a result, the temperature difference across the length of a pipe is typically several degrees and has effective conductivity ranges anywhere from 10,000 to 200,000 watts per meter K, depending upon the design. Heat pipes with standard, with, uh, copper water heat pipes with standard types of wicks uh, can withstand heat fluxes in the 25 to 75 watts per square centimeter range, and we can also design custom wicks for much higher heat fluxes. So when to use heat pipes? Uh, you would use heat pipes if you want to transfer heat from point A to point B from a heat source to an external sink, if you want to spread the thermal load out, or if you're looking to isothermalize a surface. Some of the benefits with heat pipes are size, weight, power, and flexibility. Uh, with size, by having more effective heat transfer, the overall system size can be reduced. Um, heat pipes are also lightweight components that can also help to reduce the overall system weight. Heat pipes can be used to uh, cool a, a variety of high power components, i.e. these hot spots, and this can help to increase uh, the maximum power output for the electronics. And flexibility, heat pipes can be made in many shapes and sizes. Some of the pictures you see here on the upper right is a high K plate. We'll talk about that in more detail in a few minutes. And below that is, our, is a heat pipe and threaded structure for a, rot for a radar application. Next, I want to go over some general manufacturing guidelines for, for heat pipes, some rules of thumb. First is for bending. The bend radius we try to have uh, greater than three times the outside diameter of the tube. If you go much smaller than that, uh, you can have permanent, permanent deformation of the tube wall, uh, such as crinkling of the tube wall. So we try to keep it around three times the OD. Flatness, we try to maintain two-thirds the outside diameter of the pipe. By flattening, you will lower the, the transport capability. Uh, we have gone thinner than that in the past, but uh, it, the important feature is that you need to make sure that you understand how much power the pipe can actually carry if you go thinner. In terms of standard pipe sizes and attachment methods, uh, standard sizes in metric are you know, from three millimeters up, and in English, from eighth of an inch in diameter up to one inch. Uh, for our attachment methods, heat pipes are, are used in higher level assemblies that you've seen in some of the, in some of the photos, including uh, evaporator and condenser mounting and fins. So the attachment methods for these components are uh, epoxy and solder. Next, we want to discuss heat pipe transport capabilities and their limits. The limits for a heat pipe are, are capillary, sonic, flooding, and viscous limits, but capillary typically dominates, and we're going to talk about that this afternoon. If you take a look at the pressure balance equation below, the capillary pumping capability must be greater than the sum of all the pressure drops within the system, including vapor, liquid, and gravitational pressure drops. In most cases, the liquid and gravitational pressure drops dominate. So we have two examples shown here. The charts that you see on the right are from ACT's heat pipe calculator, which is actually up on our website. These, show, this, uh, these plots show power as a function of operating temperature. We have an example shown for an 8-inch long heat pipe with a 2-inch evaporator, a 2-inch condenser with a standard wick structure. The top chart, sh chart shows predicted performance while operating in a horizontal orientation, and the chart below uh, shows the same pipe operating at 4 inches against gravity. So there is a reduction in performance due to the added gravitational pressure drop. If you take a look for a quarter-inch pipe operating at 60 degrees C, for the horizontal, it has maximum capability of 54 watts versus 34 watts at 4 inches against gravity. If there are multiple bends in the pipe, you want to use the maximum difference uh, in the gravitational direction. So we recommend that you go to our, our website and, and take a look at the, the uh, heat pipe calculator. We'll spend the next several slides looking at modeling guidelines. Uh, determine the overall, to determine the overall resistance in a heat pipe, you need to add up all the resistances throughout the, the system. Uh, first is the radial uh, conduction through the wall and the wick for both the evaporator and the condenser. Next is the evaporation and condensation uh, resistances, which is typically 0.2 centimeters squared degrees C per watt. And then you have axial resistance along the length of the pipe, and that's typically 0.02 centimeters squared degrees C per watt. So uh, a typical rule of thumb is del delta T's, and most heat pipes is 2 to 5 degrees. 
One of the questions that we were asked on a routine basis is how to model heat pipes in conventional finite element CFD packages. Uh, we would start with a, with a simple model, use a solid rod to demonstrate the uh, heat pipe with a high conductivity. We recommend starting at 10,000 watts per meter K and adjust it accordingly until the delta T along that length is two to five degrees. Um, when you take a look at your application, you need to determine how much power you think the pipe is going to carry. You also need to go to our heat pipe calculator to make sure that the pipe can carry the, carry the required thermal load. If we go back to the previous example, uh, for a quarter inch pipe operating at 60 degrees C, at uh, horizontal it was carrying 54 watts. If we wanted to carry 75 watts, we would need to either go to a larger pipe diameter, multiple pipes, or a different design. So if you're close in design, we recommend you ca contact the ACT design engineers. The finite element analysis on the right shows the as provided a model system uh, on, the, on, the, on the top and the model on the bottom which included pipes that were, were uh, bonded into the base plate structure. Next I want to talk about high conductivity or high K plates. A high K plate is an aluminum conduction plate with embedded heat pipes where we take an aluminum plate, we all end mill slots into the plate and we solder copper water heat pipes within those slots and then we fly cut it smooth. Uh, the, the conductivity, thermal conductivity for aluminum is typically 180 to 200 watts per meter K depending upon the grade. With embedded heat pipes, we can increase that uh, effective conductivity up to 500 to 1200 watts per meter K. So when would you use that? You would use a high K plate to reduce uh, hot spot temperatures, enhance conduction cooled coal plates, and also for liquid or air cooled chassis. Uh, some of the benefits that you would see were are higher with the higher conductivity is uh, create a higher fin efficiency and lower weight by optimizing the overall design. Some of the other benefits are it, it has a structural, st the structural strength equivalent to that of aluminum and the weight is near equivalent to that of aluminum. There is minimal mass penalty with the inclusion of heat pipes into the plates. One of the questions we've oft often been asked you know, with the high conductivity plates is how thin can we make those because they, with the volume restrictions in most of the newer avionics box designs, they're, they're, ver they're very limited on volume. So we've been able to uh, develop uh, high K plates as low as 1.83 millimeters, 0.072 inches. Next is how would you model a high K plate? Uh, we have validated through testing the effective conductivity anywhere from 600 to 1200 watts per meter K. We would recommend adjusting a conductivity for your, for your conduction plate, if it's a plate of aluminum, to 600. And we are confident with a, with a, with a pipe layout that we can meet or exceed that, that conductivity. Finite element analysis that you see on the right, the upper um, view shows the as, uh, the as uh, supplied design. You can see some of the hot spots located there. And below that, you can see the design with the embedded heat pipes. You can see, you actually can see the ghost images of the pipes there with coal rails on left and right. In this design, we're able to reduce the temperature by about 23 degrees. I'd like to take the next several slides to discuss reliability topics uh, re related to heat pipes. Uh, for both commercial and military application. First is the temperature extremes. Uh, there's a wide range of temperature extremes that are out there for, for many different missions, minus 55 to 85 for operational, minus 55 to 125 for survival. There's a wide range out of, of, of for a wide range of applications. For the lower temperature range, below a zero degree C, heat transfer with a copper water heat pipe is mostly by conduction. Thermal management using the uh, below zero degree C, thermal management using heat pipe is top, not typically needed although you do need to run your thermal models to verify that. Um, as the avionics box temperature starts to increase above the freezing point of water, the heat pipes will start to operate. For the upper air temperature range, say above 100 degrees C, the vapor pressure of water is positive compared to ambient. So there are two areas that you need to address. One is the wall thickness and the second is the final seal. Uh, the heat pipe envelope, uh, the, um, the wall thickness, you know, it, above, below, uh, above 100 degrees C, it can be a, a pressure vessel, so we just size it accordingly. But we also make sure that the wall thicknesses are, th are thin enough uh, you know, to, for weight constraints. So we evaluate each application. And then the second is final seal. In a copper water heat pipe, the final seal is a pinch weld, a cold weld. Uh, the final pinch weld seal integrity is usually good up to a roughly 225 degrees C. We can go higher than that if we brace the fill tubes closed. Uh, finally, I just want to make one mention of, uh, of copper water vapor chambers. We're going to talk about that in a few minutes. The maximum operational survivor te survival temperature for copper water vapor chambers is 105 degrees C, and that is mainly due to the flat, flat plate geometry. 
Next is thermal cycling. The main premise here is that the wick structure within the pipe um, should be saturated with no excess fluids that can bridge the gap across the inside diameter of the heat pipe, causing deformation after repeated freeze thaw. It's established by proper control of the fluid charge and processing operations in heat pipe manufacturer. So uh, we, some of the, you can see some of the uh, typical freeze thaw tests that have been conducted at ACT from minus 20 to plus 20, minus 45 to a, plus 125 degrees C for many cycles. We also have some free salt cycle uh, data that is shown there, as well as the environmental um, uh, test chambers that we use for the free salt testing. Next, we'll discuss acceleration. The question is whether a heat pipe will under, operate under adverse accelerations, which is typical of most military avionics applications. If we remember the equation earlier, there is a term for gravity. With acceleration, there is an added term and an added gra uh, pressure drop due to the acceleration. This results in a decrease in performance depending upon the orientation. So what exactly is going to happen? Um, under adverse elevations, the wick will deprime and dry out, but the wick will quickly reprime after the acceleration event ends. There will be some thermal transients that will exist, and transient modeling will need to be conducted over the event duration to assure that there's enough system mass uh, is available to cool the electronics during, during the transient. So when you're talking with the ACT design engineers, it's important that we know all of your requirements. Most avionics applications, the acceleration orientation can be in any axis, so we design for the worst case scenario. But there are other, op um, there are other options if we know the orientation of the gravity. We can de design the pipes to be gravity aided, or we can arrange the pipes in pairs so that one pipe is always gravity aided. Shock and vibration. Heat pipes are typically robust and can, and can withstand most shock and vibration con conditions for a variety of applications. Testing has confirmed that vibration loading has little or no impact on the performance of ACT heat pipes. Uh, shock and vibration testing show no evidence of overstress or fatigue on the heat pipes or solder joints. One example shown here is for a loop heat pipe assembly that was successfully subjected to satellite launch environments. Next on the agenda is related um, technologies. And we're briefly gonna describe vapor chambers, pump two-phase mini channels, and phase change materials. Vapor chambers. Um, like, con like conventional cylindrical heat pipes, vapor chambers transport heat from a heat source to a heat sink with a very small temperature gradient. Vapor chamber heat pipes are often used to accept heat from small, high heat flux sources and transfer that heat to much larger low heat flux heat sink where the heat can be uh, effectively dissipated. So you can see that in the lower left where you have the high flux coming in at a point source and being distributed out over a much larger area uh, for low flux heat output. The upper right hand picture shows uh, the assembly of a, a vapor chamber. In the middle of that shows the internal structure of the vapor chamber showing the wick structure and the cylindrical posts that are there for structural rigidity. The plate below that goes on top, that's the lid, and then you can put a thin heat sink on top of that. An advancement in the vapor chamber state of the art is with the inclusion of low CTE materials such as with aluminum nitride direct bond copper package within the vapor chamber construction for direct bond attached to electronics. ACT has developed high flux, low CTE vapor chamber with an evaporator wick structure that is capable of over 500 watts per square centimeter at a, at a very low heat flux. This exceeds the performance of a, of a, of a copper spreader uh, one, by one and a half times for a three centimeter by three um, centimeter uh, vapor chamber size. Now we have some new materials that are, that are involved with this. So we are currently doing a, uh, checking on the reliability of the material system through life testing. And this is for applications where we're targeting high power electronics for insertion directly into chip packages. Next, ACT has developed a mini channel heat exchanger for high heat flux applications. The technical challenge is flow boiling instabilities and the resulting oscillations in pressure and heat sink base temperature, which lower the critical heat flux. Uh, these oscillations can potentially cause structural failure and also can, the, the device being cooled can experience large temperature swings, which can adversely affect performance. So we've developed a, um, a micropore coating that is to improve heat transfer, suppress the, these instabilities, and increase the critical heat flux. Uh, we've demonstrated heat flux up to 500 watts per square centimeter with minimal thermal resistance. This was demonstrated in a two-phase re refrigerant loop that was uh, developed by ACT. 
And lastly, under the, um, the related se uh, technology section is phase change. Some systems have highly variable thermal loads where the peak load can be many times that compared to the baseline loading. One solution developed by ECT is to use a phase change material heat exchanger to store heat during these peak loads and gradually bleed, bleed off that heat during baseline operations. So for a vapor compression system, you can size the vapor compression system for the average load, not the peak load. Uh, we've, we've demonstrated that by using an integral PCM heat exchanger, we've been able to reduce an overall system mass by 36%. Lastly, on the agenda, we want to talk, go over an avionics case study. Uh, in this st a case study, an aircraft avionics enclosure was subjected to a variety of constraints. We had wide temperature range uh, for operation and survivabilities. The heat sink was, was uh, at overcapacity. The electronics were buried deep within an avionics box, resulting in large thermal resistance from the components inside the box uh, to an available heat sink. And lastly, both mass and volume had to be minimized. The footprint had to stay the same, and they didn't want any, any additional mass added to the system. So we developed a, a, a three-part solution to solve this problem. Uh, first, we used insulation around the electronics enclosure. Second, we spot-cooled critical components to the coolant channels using heat pipes. And lastly, we improved the heat distribution within the, the system by using high K plates. You can see here some of the finite element analysis. On the left-hand side was the as-supply design where you can see some of the hot spots. And then with this, this, the three-part solution uh, integrated into that, you can see the results on the right-hand side. If we take a look at a cross-sectional view, notational cross-sectional view of this solution, um, you can see that there is a large delta T from the inner chips to the coolant. Uh, as you can see, there's a fairly large tortuous path going through there. We have um, the tortuous path is from the chip to the circuit board, the circuit board to the heat sink, heat sink to the aluminum post, uh, the aluminum post to the case, and then the case to liquid. So as part of this solution, ACT used heat pipes to reduce the internal delta T. This included heat pipes within the post, heat pipes embedded within the aluminum sink, and also heat pipes to high flux or problem chips. As a result, the overall temperature gradient within the generic box was decreased by 25 degrees, which in turn allowed us, uh, allowed the, uh, us to increase the allowable coolant temperature by 25 degrees or allow more flexibility with heat sink selection. And in this case, the, uh, the test did agreed well with, with the model predictions. So wrapping up, uh, we hope this presentation this afternoon provided some assistance to design engineers of aviation platforms for, by providing direction to the understanding benefits and potential uses associated with heat pipes and high K plates. As you can see, many of the challenges facing the avionic system designers can be met with a proper design of a thermal management system, which includes heat pipes and high K plates and their associated re related technologies. ACT has the experience in the design, prototyping, and manufacture of these systems, and we think this makes us an ideal um, thermal management partner. So with that, I thank you for your time this afternoon, and we will take some questions. Thanks, John. At this time, we'd like to begin our Q&A. If you have a question, you may submit it by entering it in the box at the bottom of your screen. And to lead off, John, does a heat pipe operate at a fixed temperature? And if not, what sets the temperature? A, a heat pipe can basically operate at any temperature between the freezing point and the critical point, although performance drops off sharply, both very low and very high temperatures. The heat pipe can operate at any temperature. It's really set by the heat sink and heat source conditions. So you can basically think of the heat pipe as a superconductor, but you're going to have thermal resistances into the heat pipe, a small thermal resistance in the heat pipe, and a thermal resistance out of the heat pipe. And the balance of those combinations and your source and sink temperatures sets the operating temperature. What heat pipe fluid wall combination would I use if the heat pipe must operate below zero degrees centigrade? We would typically use, uh, we normally use copper with water working fluid. If you really need to be re removing heat below zero C, then we would probably go to copper methanol. But note that normally when you're keeping your electronics, you just want to keep them from overheating. And if the whole box is at zero degrees C, you've kind of solved your problem already until things start to warm up. What's the expected operating lifetime for a heat pipe? 
uh, very long. Uh, typically, you'll do a, a life test on a new combination of fluid and uh, envelope material to see how long they last. But people have been doing copper water heat pipe life tests for over 20 years. And after a certain point, you basically realize that what you're doing is life testing a cartridge heater because every five years or so they burn out, but the heat pipes just keep operating. So it's typically n never been a, a, a concern. Okay. What is the typical G limit for heat pipes application? That's really very application specific. Basically what you have to do is, as John said, you have to have the capillary pumping capability has to be greater than the gravitational and accelerational pressure drop, the vapor pressure drop, and the liquid pressure drop. So if you have a short adverse elevation in the direction of the acceleration, then um, your G loadings can be fairly high. Typically, we can design, say, a four-inch heat pipe to about three Gs. Above that, typically the heat pipe will stop operating and then we'll recover when the G loading goes back down below 4 Gs. And normally you're only going to see that in military aircraft for fairly short periods of time in a specific direction. Aviation applications also have some severe requirements with heating. Oh, I'm sorry, where did my question go? <laughs> Hang on a second. Um, that question apparently, oh no, there we are. Start again. Aviation applications have some severe requirements with heating, not just cooling, in order to keep electronics at reasonable temperatures when going from sea level to high altitude. Could you talk a little bit about this combination of requirements as it may apply to heat pipes and heat sinking in general? I mean, essentially you can think of a heat pipe as a superconductor. So whatever you source and sink are doing, they're going to be pretty much linked. We can um, develop certain heat pipes, like if your sink gets too hot, we can have a diode heat pipe which will prevent backflow of heat, but, and we have variable conductance heat pipes which will also throttle, but they're kind of a more exotic thing. We'd have to discuss the application more specifically with you. What software does ACT use for modeling the heat transfer? We have a bunch, we, we have some commercial software for some of our heat transfer type, um, looking at conduction in and out and all. The software for the heat pipe design itself is ACT uh, developed software. What has been ACT's experience using ethylene glycol as a transfer medium? That's, we have not used ethylene glycol in a heat pipe type system. Okay. That's, that's what you're talking about. I mean, we, we use it often for pump, pump systems and all, but we're not covering that in this webinar. What is the effect of altitude on heat pipe performance? Basically, there's going to be no effect at all. The heat pipes are, are normally operating under a slight vacuum with respect to atmospheric pressure, but even going down to vacuum, you wouldn't expect a difference in the heat pipe behavior. Thank you. I'm afraid that's all the time we have today. Again, if we did not get a chance to answer your question, our sponsors will do their best to address them after today's presentation. Thanks, everyone, for joining us. Just a reminder, this webcast will be available on demand at www.techbriefs.com for the next 12 months.